Good evening and welcome to the therapy session live. I hope you're sitting comfortably and that you have a cocktail or mocktail to hand. A rather lovely cranberry juice. Cheers. While you're getting yourselves comfortable, I'll just tell you about the theme of this evening, which is hot summer literature. Get your sunglasses on because it's going to be a bright, sparkly, sizzling conversation. And I'd love to know if any of you have particular favourite hot summer reads. If you do, let me know what they are by sending a message on Instagram or on Facebook. I would love to hear what are your favourite hot summer reads. I'm going to be talking about a variety of classic and modern literature. And the theme is hot summers in literature. So not your favourite hot summer reads in terms of being amazing reads, but books which actually are all about heat and summers and particular summers in literature. I'm sure that many of you or possibly all of you have a summer from your life that is the summer of your life. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? Or a defining summer of your life. Mine, personally, would have been the summer of 1976, which was a heat wave in Britain. And there's actually a couple of books that we're going to be talking about this evening, which are based on that very heat wave. And that summer for me was an amazing summer because I was eight and I was at a boarding school where... There were only 80 pupils and they had a swimming pool. And the joy of that summer was that I was a swimming prefect, age eight. And I was allowed to go out every morning at 6.30 in the morning to unroll the cover of the swimming pool with two other girls who were also eight. And then we could swim before anyone else woke up or came down for breakfast. So we had that swimming pool to ourselves at 6.30 in the morning, which was absolute bliss. Furthermore, our English teacher was also the PE teacher and the history teacher. And for that whole summer of 1976, when there was a heat wave, whenever she was teaching us history or English, she would say, let's go for a swim. And we would go down to the pool and swim instead of doing history or English, because frankly, it was unbearably hot for us Brits who are useless at coping with hot summers. And so we used to swim. And so that was my amazing summer of 1976. And I'm sure many of you will have a summer that you remember as being a particularly defining summer of your childhood or your teens or maybe your 20s. Um, but that's interesting in itself. And I'd love to know if you're able to share any stories in a few comments of what those particular amazing summers of your life were. Or you can always come and have a bibliotherapy session with me one to one and tell me about it then. Um, but also there are amazingly moving and profound hot summers in literature which stay with you forever and define the way you think about summer forever more as well. So I'm going to be fairly chronological, if possible, this evening, talking about the various hot summers in literature, classical to the present, which I have found particularly wonderful in various different ways. But I'd also love you to tell me yours as we go along, if you do have favourite hot summers. Great to see you all joining me this evening. Um, I will keep looking on Facebook to see if I'm getting any comments there. I'm seeing Helen there on Facebook. Excellent. And I'm seeing lots of people coming in on Instagram. Hi. Hope you're enjoying the lovely hot weather that we're having. And I hope you're feeling really summery and in the mood for more heat in your fiction this evening. So I'm going to start with First Love by Ivan Turgenev which was published in March 1860. And the author claimed it as probably his most autobiographical novel. It's a really great read by the great Russian author. I think it's probably his most approachable book. 
Um, and it apparently retells an incident from Turgenev's own life, which was all about his infatuation with a young neighbour in the country, Princess Catherine Shakovskoy, who in the novella, because it's a novella, it's nice and short, this book, is called Zineda. Um, and I'm not going to give you spoilers because there is a very dramatic spoiler, a very dramatic moment in this novel when everything is turned on its head. And that's what makes the book so brilliant. But it's all about a boy age 16 who's in the first flush of youth, feeling full of the joys of imminent adulthood and falling in love for the first time. Hence the title, First Love. But it all happens over a very hot summer. And I would really recommend it. It's a great read and it won't take you too long to read either. I'll read you a little extract so you can get a sense of what the book is like. I was 16 then. It happened in the summer of 1833. I lived in Moscow with my parents. They'd taken a country house for the summer near the Kaluga Gate, facing the Niskuchny Gardens. I was preparing for the university, but didn't work much and was in no hurry. No one interfered with my freedom. I did what I liked, especially after parting with my last tutor, a Frenchman who had never been able to get used to the idea that he had fallen like a bomb into Russia, comme une bombe, and would lie sluggishly in bed with an expression of exasperation on his face for days together. My father treated me with careless kindness. My mother scarcely noticed me. My father, a man still young and very handsome, had married her from mercenary considerations. She was ten years older than he. My mother led a melancholy life. She was forever agitated, jealous and angry, but not in my father's presence. She was very much afraid of him and he was severe, cold and distant in his behaviour. I've never seen a man more elaborately serene, self-confident and commanding. I shall never forget the first weeks I spent at the country house. The weather was magnificent. We left town on the 9th of May, on St Nicholas's Day. I used to walk about in our garden, in the Niskuchny Gardens and beyond the town gates. I would take some book with me, Kedanov's course, for instance, but I rarely looked into it and more often than anything, declaimed verses aloud. I knew a great deal of poetry by heart, which we all should do now. Who out there knows a great deal of poetry by heart? I urge you to try and learn some this summer so that you can declaim verses aloud when you're wandering around the countryside. My blood was in a ferment and my heart ached so sweetly and absurdly. I was all hope and anticipation, was a little frightened of something and full of wonder at everything, and was on the tiptoe of expectation. My imagination played continually, fluttering rapidly about the same fancies, like Martin's about a bell tower at dawn. I dreamed, was sad, even wept, but through the tears and through the sadness, inspired by a musical verse or the beauty of evening, shot up like grass in spring the delicious sense of youth and effervescent life. I had a horse to ride. I used to saddle it myself and set off alone for long rides, break into a rapid gallop and fancy myself a knight at a tournament. How gaily the wind whistled in my ears, or turning my face towards the sky, I would absorb its shining radiance and blew into my soul that opened wide to welcome it. I remember that at that time, the image of woman, the vision of love, scarcely ever arose in definite shape in my brain. But in all I thought, in all I felt, lay hidden a half-conscious, shame-faced presentiment of something new, unbearably sweet, feminine. This presentiment, this expectation, permeated my whole being. I breathed in it. It coursed through my veins with every drop of blood. It was destined to be soon fulfilled. So we know from the very beginning that he's on the verge of love. He's about to fall in love. And the the book actually begins with a group of old men sitting around and talking about their first love. So we know that he's looking back from a position of age on this moment in his life, which is why he's so he can speak about it so wisely and with such 
great understanding of what was going on in not only his heart but also his father's heart and it's a really compelling beautiful read but also amazing descriptions of nature and I'm just going to read you a little bit more to give you the moment of the jolt when he first meets the woman that he falls in love with. Suddenly I heard a voice. I looked across the fence and was thunderstruck. I was confronted with a curious spectacle. A few paces from me on the grass between the green raspberry bushes stood a tall slender girl in a striped pink dress with a white kerchief on her head. Four young men were close round her and she was slapping them by turns on the forehead with those small grey flowers, the name of which I don't know, though they are well known to children. The flowers form little bags and burst open with a pop when you strike them against anything hard. Does anyone out there know what those flowers are? I'm imagining they might be a bit like honesty or those little kind of square flowers which have a air in the middle of them and they've got a sort of papery case. And Turgenev here is describing four men <laughs> um, bursting these flowers. Well, they're sorry, they're presenting their foreheads eagerly to a beautiful young woman who's bursting the flowers against their foreheads. Very peculiar. The young men presented their foreheads so eagerly, and in the gestures of the girl, I saw her in profile. There was something so fascinating, imperious, caressing, mocking and charming that I almost cried out with admiration and delight and would, I thought, have given everything in the world on the spot to have had those exquisite fingers strike me on the forehead. My gun slipped onto the grass. I forgot everything. I devoured with my eyes the graceful shape and neck and lovely arms and the slightly disordered fair hair under the white kerchief and the half-closed clever eye and the eyelashes and the soft cheek beneath them. He's then observed by another man who um, takes the mickey out of him for falling so instantly in love with this woman and for staring at her so rudely and unashamedly and then our young hero goes home to his dad and his father says to him what's the matter my father asked me all at once have you killed a rook i was on the point of telling him all about it but i checked myself and merely smiled to myself as i was going to bed i rotated I don't know why, three times on one leg, permaded my hair, got into bed and slept like a top all night. Before morning, I woke up for an instant, raised my head, looked round me in ecstasy and fell asleep again. That's First Love by Ivan Turgenev, a really gorgeous novella for people who are just joining now, which is all about one hot summer when our hero is 16. He falls in love for the first time and the descriptions of his life are incredibly beautiful as he's spending all his time riding around the countryside, having a pretty gorgeous, very lazy time. Um, but then he falls in love with this girl and things get more interesting and intense. And I won't tell you what happens, but there are dramas that unfurl as the temperature of the summer increases, which is a common theme to many of these hot summer books. As the temperatures rise, so do the tensions of the protagonists in many of these classic novels. Um, for instance, we can't talk about hot summers in literature without mentioning The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald which is another great classic and another lovely, rather short, enjoyably short book. I was talking to Mark Billingham, the crime writer, on Monday night at the House of St Barnabas, and he was complaining about how everyone writes novels that are just too long these days. And I'm glad to think that I'm talking about some slightly shorter books that I'm recommending to you and which you should definitely read if you've never read before. The Great Gatsby. Everyone knows the story, but have you all read the book? If you haven't, read it this summer because it really is a great read. It's set uh, in Jazz Age New York and it was published in 1925, telling the tragic story of Jay Gatsby, a self-made millionaire, and his pursuit of Daisy Buchanan. 
I won't tell you exactly what happens, even because if you don't know, then you're in for a treat of reading it. There's obviously the rather fabulous films as well. But the book is narrated by Nick Carraway, who recounts the events of the summer of 1922 when he takes a house in the fictional village of West Egg on Long Island. There he lives among the newly rich, while across the water in the more refined village of East Egg, also fictionalised, live his cousin Daisy and their her brutish, wealthy husband, Tom Buchanan. As the hot summer progresses, and there are some amazingly gorgeous descriptions again of the heat as it rises and intensifies the emotions, Nick is finally invited to attend one of the dazzling parties held by Jay Gatsby, his neighbour. And I don't know about you, but I've always felt like those Jay Gatsby parties have been, in my mind, the ultimate party that we all want to be invited to. And how often have we been to those Gatsby parties? Let's have one if we can. Uh, so our hero goes to finally Gatsby's house and he gets to know him to some degree. And I won't tell you everything that unfurls because it's all far too dramatic if you don't know the story. But I will just read you a little bit from the book, which is really great in terms of heat. And I just want to find you that moment in the book because the descriptions of the, the heat that they're surrounded by are incredibly vivid and believable. And when you read it, you really feel like you are sweating along with them. The prolonged and tumultuous argument that ended by herding us into that room eludes me, though I have a sharp physical memory that, in the course of it, my underwear kept climbing like a damp snake around my legs and intermittent beads of sweat raced cool across my back. The notion originated with Daisy's suggestion that we hire five bathrooms and take cold baths and then assumed more tangible form as a place to have a mint julep. Each of us said over and over that it was a crazy idea. We all talked at once to a baffled clerk and thought, or pretended to think, that we were being very funny. The room was large and stifling, and though it was already four o'clock, opening the windows admitted only a great gust of hot shrubbery from the park. Daisy went to the mirror and stood with her back to us, fixing her hair. Open another window, commanded Daisy, without turning round. There aren't any more. Well, we'd better telephone for an axe. The thing to do is to forget about the heat, said Tom impatiently. You make it ten times worse by crabbing about it. He unrolled the bottle of whiskey from the towel and put it on the table. So that's The Great Gatsby, which is an excellent hot summer read, which if you haven't had the joy of reading it, you certainly must this summer. Another old favourite, which I have talked about before, and so I won't linger on for too long, is The Go-Between by L.P. Hartley, which is one of my favourite books ever. And it's also particularly brilliant in terms of heat, because it all takes place in 1901, when there is an intense heat wave and the heat keeps ratcheting up, as do the amorous dramas going on around the hero who's 12-year-old Leo. I've actually done a whole session all about the go-between if you go to my YouTube channel. Uh, so people that are interested in this book can find out more if you go there and look for the go-between. But I am going to read you a bit because it's just so good. It's such an incredibly vivid book. And I very frequently urge people to read this aloud to each other because it's really gripping. Every chapter leaves you on a total cliffhanger and it's just so beautifully written that you want to keep reading forevermore. But it's a great book to spread out over the summer and read aloud with someone in your house or a friend. I climbed the stile into the water meadow and at once the sun caught me in its fierce embrace. This is Leo, who's 12, who's delivering a letter from Marion, the heroine of the novel, who's 19, to 
the gamekeeper and um, handyman who lives on the grounds of their incredibly posh country house. What strength it had! The boggy pools that fringed the causeway were almost dried up. The stalks that had been below the waterline showed a band of dirty yellow where the sun had scorched them. And standing on the sluice platform, I saw almost with dismay how far the had sunk. On the blue side, the deep side, I could see stones at the bottom that had never been visible before. And on the other side, the gold and green side, the water was almost lost to view beneath the trailing weeds which, piled on another, gave a distressing impression of disarray. And the water lilies, instead of lying on the water, stuck up awkwardly above it. All this the sun had done. Something to me too, it had changed the colour of my thoughts. I no longer felt the bitter shame for Marion that I'd felt in the shadow of the trees. Whether I realised the helplessness of nature to contend with nature, I don't know, but my heart, which could not bear to feel unkindly towards her, softened the strictures that my mind was heaping on her, so that the act of spooning, when associated with her, no longer seemed the most damaging activity that a human being could engage in. But it did not help me to find a new attitude. I was too honest with myself to say, spooning is all right because she does it, or other people mustn't spoon, but she can. After all, she had to have someone to spoon with. And what was right for her, almost for the first time, I thought of Ted Burgess as her spooning partner. It was not a pleasant thought. Where was he? Not in the field the men were reaping. I could see that at a glance. I went down to them. Mr Burgess is up at the farm, they told me. He's got a job on there. What is it? I asked. They smiled, but did not enlighten me. And so it goes on. But I love the descriptions of the sun in this book. And Leo is very much obsessed with the signs of the zodiac and the powers that they have. He's very much a boy who's been brought up with a classical education about myths and he's very conscious of the metamorphosing effects of the sun and how the sun has worked on the land around him and how it's making everything get intensely hot um, and change its very nature but also not only how it's doing that to the nature but how it's doing that to him too he can feel himself changing as the days go on so read this book it's fabulous also if you like go to my youtube channel and find more out about the go-between which is a truly excellent and very hot book in many ways it's not just hot in temperature moving on i'm going to mention the rather gorgeous classic novel, novella really, A Month in the Country by J.L. Carr, which I'm just trying to find because I know I've got it somewhere to show you. Oh, there she goes. It's on the floor. So A Month in the Country, another gorgeously short book. So um, L.P. Hartley, not quite so short, brilliant read, very portable. I think it's actually near 265 pages, A Month in the Country, a lovely slim novella, a mere 83 pages long. I'm obviously suddenly trying to sell you lots of short books to read over the summer, but maybe it's something about writing hot summer literature that people often write it much shorter than maybe cold, long literature. Tracy, great to see you. Um, she's saying she loves The Great Gatsby, which is fabulous. And anyone, as I said, who hasn't read it, you've got to read it. Read it this summer. Make it your mission. So A Month in the Country, another fabulous read by J.L. Carr. It was short, Booker shortlisted. It's a semi-autobiographical novel published in 1980, but it looks back to an earlier time books that feels much more um, as if it's a classic, I mean an ancient classic, than it really is. Written in 1980, would you believe it? Um, 
So the narrator, Tom Birkin, reflects on a summer spent in the small Yorkshire village of Ox Godby in 1920. So it's set in 1920, which is why it also feels a bit like a Thomas Hardy novel. Near destitute and still visibly shaken by his experiences during the First World War and through the painful breakup of his marriage, he's been assigned the job of restoring a medieval mural hidden beneath whitewash on the wall of the village church. As he painstakingly removes several centuries worth of paint and grime, he becomes gradually less closed off to the world and he begins to make friends with the community around him. In particular, with Moon, another war veteran, who's camped in the churchyard, ostensibly looking for a lost grave. As Birkin uncovers patches of gilt and cinnabar up on his scaffold, Moon digs his pits outside the church walls. Both of them striving for some sort of, if not restoration, then, then freedom from their past. So for Oxbody, at least, this summer is a period of healing in his life. And this is one of those books that, once you've read people tend to feel very passionately is an absolutely brilliant read and it is one of those very healing re reads which is all about the healing power of nature but it's also all about solitude because he spends all his time in a church slowly uncovering a mural and while talking about it it did remind me of another brilliant book which is much more recent leaping ahead um, to a book that's only just come out, The Great Golden Circle, which is by Benjamin Myers, which is a book which I'm sure I'm going to talk about again in another context. And it's not all about one summer, so it doesn't totally fit in with this topic. So I'll just talk about it for a minute. But it's an amazing book, which is all about a man, two men who are friends creating crop circles. So they have this urge to create the perfect crop circle. They're doing it for love, for love of art and for the joy of creation and in order to make something which is outside the capitalist world. And it does describe amazing, beautiful, hot summer nights when these two men are going out in the middle of the night and creating their magnificent and incredibly mathematically perfect crop circles and that's a book that came to mind when talking about a month in the country because it has a similar kind of atmosphere a similar kind of amazing um, praising of the joys of nature and a way of thinking about nature very mindfully and very much in a way that makes you want to go and camp in the middle of the woods overnight and appreciate the sounds of the dawn and the sounds in the middle of the night too. So I would also urge you to read that. Uh, that's The Perfect Golden Circle, just published. Now moving on to another lovely slim novel. I didn't deliberately choose all these because of their slimness. Call Me By Your Name by Andre Ackerman, which takes place in the summer of 1983. And it's all about 17-year-old Elio Perlman spending the days with his family at their 17th century villa in Lombardy, Italy. He soon meets Oliver, a handsome doctoral student who's working as an intern for Elio's father. They live in an absolutely beautiful, charmed, gorgeous existence of a house. And it's a sun-drenched, splendiferous, beautiful manor. They have a swimming pool, there are lakes and rivers near them, and Elio and Oliver discover the heady beauty of awakening desire over the course of this one summer, which will alter their lives forever. It's an incredibly intense, hot, beautiful, amazing novel, and um, Andre Ackerman has recently published the sequel to it as well, which I think he wrote 20 years after writing um, Call Me By Your Name. And it's a really, I might be wrong there, don't quote me on that, but I know there was a big gap in between the two. 
it's one of those books which is incredibly intense, passionate, romantic, sexual, and there's some pretty awesome scenes in it, which I'll let you discover for yourselves. And I'm going to read you a little bit from it, which is one of the most hot in temperature scenes. There's also very hot scenes in terms of outrageously erotic goings on. When I think back to that summer, I can never sort the sequence of events. There are a few key scenes. Otherwise, all I remember are the repeat moments. The morning ritual before and after breakfast, Oliver lying on the grass or by the pool, I sitting at my table, then the swim or the jog, then his grabbing a bicycle and riding to see the translator in town, lunch at the large shaded dining table in the other garden, or lunch indoors, always a guest or two for lunch drudgery, the afternoon hours splendid and lush with abundant sun and silence. Then there are the leftover scenes. My father always wondering what I did with my time, why I was always alone. My mother urging me to make new friends if the old ones didn't interest me, but above all, to stop hanging around the house all the time. Books, 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 always books. And all these school books, both of them begging me to play more tennis, go dancing more often, get to know people, find out for myself why others are so necessary in life, and not just foreign bodies to be sidled up to. Do crazy things if you must, they told me all the while, forever prying to unearth the mysterious telltale signs of heartbreak, which in their clumsy, intrusive, devoted way would both instantly wish to heal, as if I were a soldier who'd strayed into their garden and needed his wound immediately staunched, or else he'd die. You can always talk to me. I was your age once, my father used to say. The things you feel and think only you have felt. Believe me, I've lived and suffered through all of them, and more than once. Some I've never gotten over, and others I'm as ignorant about as you are today. Yes, I know, almost every bend, every toll booth, every chamber in the human heart. There are other scenes, the postprandial silence, some of us napping, some working, others reading, the whole world basking away in hushed semitones. Heavenly hours when voices from the world beyond our house would filter in so softly that I was sure I'd drifted off. Then afternoon tennis, shower and cocktails, waiting for dinner, guests again, dinner, his second trip to the translator, strolling into town and back late at night, sometimes alone, sometimes with friends. Then there are the exceptions, the stormy afternoon when we sat in the living room, listening to the music and to the hail pelting every window in the house. The lights would go out, the music would die, and all we had was each other's faces. An aunt twittering away about her dreadful years in St. Louis, Missouri, which she pronounced San Louis. Mother trailing the scent of Earl Grey tea, and in the background, all the way from the kitchen downstairs, the voices of Manfredi and Mafeda, spare whispers of a couple bickering in loud hisses. In the rain, the lean, cloaked, hooded figure of the gardener doing battle with the elements, always pulling up weeds, even in the rain. My father signalling with his arms from the living room window, Go back, on cheese, go back! That man gives me the creeps, my aunt would say. That creep has a heart of gold, my father would say. But all of these hours were strained by fear, as if fear were a brooding spectre or a stranger trapped in our own little town, whose sooty wing flecked every living thing with a shadow that would never wash. I didn't know what I was afraid of, nor why I worried so much, nor why this thing that could so easily cause panic felt like hope sometimes, and, like hope in the darkest moments, brought such joy, unreal joy, joy with a noose tied round it. The thud my heart gave when I saw him unannounced, both terrified and thrilled me. I was afraid when he showed up, afraid when he failed to, afraid when he looked at me, more frightened yet when he didn't. The agony wore me out in the end, and on scalding afternoons I'd simply give out and fall asleep on the living room sofa, and though still dreaming, know exactly who was in the room, who had tiptoed in and out, who was standing there, who was looking at me and for how long? Who was trying to pick out today's paper while making the least rustling sound, only to give up and look for tonight's film listings, whether they woke me or not? The fear never went away. I woke up to it, watched it turn to joy, 
when I heard him shower in the morning and I knew he'd been downstairs with us for breakfast, only to watch it curdle when, rather than have coffee, he would dash through the house and right away set to work in the garden. By noon, the agony of waiting to hear him say anything to me was more than I could bear. I knew that the sofa awaited me in an hour or so. It made me hate myself for feeling so hapless, so thoroughly invisible, so smitten, so callow. Just say something. Just touch me, Oliver. Look at me long enough and watch the tears well in my eyes. Knock at my door at night and see if I haven't already left it ajar for you. Walk inside. There's always room in my bed. That's Andre Ackerman. And that is the fabulous um, Call Me By Your Name, which is an amazing and very hot summer read in many regards. Let's have a little drink to Andre Ackerman. And now I'm going to move on to Instructions for a Heat Wave by Maggie O'Farrell, which is one of the books that came to mind immediately when I first thought about this topic because, partly because of the title, which is a fabulous title. And it's also set in the heat wave of 1976, the one that I was talking about earlier, which is the heat wave which many of us remember as being the hottest summer that we've ever known. There probably have been hotter summers since, maybe, but the heat wave of that summer did seem to go on forever. It had an illusion of going on for months. It was probably only a few weeks, maybe six weeks or so, but it really was insanely hot. And apparently you could fry eggs on the pavements in the summer of 1976. I wonder if that's anything people can do now. Try it. Maybe it will work. So the long, hot summer of 1976 has become legendary in the UK. Um, some people in warmer climes might think that that's a bit ridiculous because standards, it really wasn't that hot. But for us that live here all year round, it really was pretty epic. And there was actually water rationing for a while with standpipes in some areas. And this is the backdrop to Instructions for a Heat Wave by Maggie O'Farrell, which is her sixth novel, and it was Booker nominated. All of Maggie O'Farrell's novels are fabulous, and if you haven't discovered her yet, read her now. But if you want a hot summer read, Instructions for a Heat Wave is the one to pick up. It is a really intriguing and quite odd book in which um, at the heart of the book, there's a mystery in the form of Robert, a quiet, dependable, predictable man who's recently retired from his job at the bank. And every morning he leaves his house to pick up the papers. But one morning during this incredible heat wave in the middle of 1976, he leaves to go and get his newspaper and does not return. And the book is then about what happens to his wife and to his family as they all wonder where on earth he's gone and why. And Maggie O'Farrell, in her brilliant way, slowly unravels the plot and reveals to us different aspects of the many characters in the book and the many members of the family and makes it a really excellent and rather wondrous read which also has little moments splattered through it, which are instructions from the government about how to deal with the heat, hence the title, Instructions for a Heat Wave, because they're saying things like, you must not use your hose pipe between particular hours or even at all, and various other instructions that are coming from the government who are not used to having to deal with such extreme temperatures. So. It's a really interesting story about an imploding family, um, which you slowly begin to understand what's happened. But it's really quite a gripping read. Another one which is similarly intensely hot, uh, but this time published in 1958. 
so I'm afraid I've gone out of my timeline. I was trying to be um, logical going from Turgenev to the present day, but I'm afraid I've started leaping around. The Green Gage Summer by Ruma Godden, published in 1958, set in 1920, is another gorgeous summer read, which I'm sure lots of you have read. It's a coming of age story by the fabulous and brilliant Ruma Godden, which is probably her most famous book. And apparently it was on the A-level syllabus at one point in the UK. And it's all about a family of English children, four children, who go to the south of France during the summer of 1920 in order to go and see the fields of France where many, many soldiers died. And the, the story begins with the mother declaring that her children are incredibly selfish and she wants to take them to France to show them all the people that died for them so that they can now live and the children are all pretty pissed off about the whole idea very grumpy and it's a very hot summer they travel down by train and early on in the novel the mother gets bitten by a horsefly and her leg swells up terribly so she's completely taken out of action and has to go to hospital the children go on to their hotel alone um, which I wonder if that would happen nowadays. Quite probably not. They go to this wonderful hotel called Les Oyettes with its bullet scarred staircase and serene garden surrounded by high walls. There's a charming Englishman there called Elliot and Mademoiselle Zizi, who's the hotel patron and Elliot's devoted lover. And the children slowly fall under the spell of the charming gentleman Elliot who has quite a lot of dastardly um, fingers in dastardly pies in the book which I won't reveal because although this is a very sultry and intense hot book which is very much a coming of age novel it's also something of an insanely dramatic novel particularly towards the end when it suddenly turns into something more like a kind of Ian Fleming with a bit of a car chase vibe to it uh, so it's got something for everyone it's incredibly beautifully described and the very beginning of the book which unfortunately I don't have with me because I lent it to someone darn it um, describes the the green gauges oozing with their beautiful rich sap and talks about how the children spent their days picking these green gauges from the trees in the gardens of Les Oyettes. Um, and this sets the scene for a very sensual and um, generally sensually exciting summer while these poor children slowly begin to discover themselves as grown-ups or well, they're not really grown-ups but they are burgeoning and um, it is it is a really lovely book it's it's all about innocence and loss of innocence but it's not a book in which anything bad happens but it is very dramatic at the same time so that's the green gauge summer another fabulous hot summer read and while we're in France I would like to move on to um, Bonjour Tristesse by Françoise Sagan written when she was only 17 um, and another lovely slim novella which is all about 17 year old Cécile um, by the way in the Green Gage Summer, the heroine is also called Cecily. There's a coincidence. Cecile spends her summer in a villa on the French Riviera with her father Raymond and his current mistress, the young, superficial, fashionable Elsa, who gets on well with Cecile. Raymond is an attractive, worldly, amoral man. 
who excuses his serial philandering by quoting Oscar Wilde. Sin is the only note of vivid colour that persists in the modern world. So this is Raymond, who's Cecile's father, who frankly is a bit of a cad. And Cecile is very much used to her lovely existence with her father. They have a good thing going. They're quite happy just doing their own thing, having quite selfish lives. And they're having a lovely, peaceful holiday together on the French Riviera until their holiday is shattered by the arrival of Anne, who Raymond had vaguely invited, but not necessarily really meant her to come. And she is a cultured, principled, intelligent, hard-working woman of Raymond's age. And she regards herself as a kind of godmother to Cecile, and she starts trying to get Cecile to do things that she doesn't want to do, like some work for school. Cecile's horrified by this threat to her easy existence, and she decides to do something about trying to get rid of Anne. And that's when things become interesting and possibly rather dark. So that is another hot and brilliant summer read, all of which takes place over one summer. And it's a life changing summer too. So many more to talk about. I'm going to have to speed up. Um, After Me Comes the Flood by Sarah Perry. It's her first novel. Sarah Perry very well known for her fabulous book, The Essex Serpent. This was her first book. And it's a very mysterious, great, bizarre, brilliant read, which uh, feels somehow not like England, but it is set in England. It's about John Cole, who owns a bookshop in London. And this bookshop, according to his brother, fits him just like a shell. John Cole is a bit of a Um, quiet introvert and one blisteringly hot summer's day during the middle of a heat wave when all of the city is beginning to leave town from London he goes off to his brother's house in Norfolk where he hopes the weather will be cooler on his way his car overheats and he ends up deflecting to another country house where he arrives and it's somewhere he's never been but everyone acts as if they know him so it's all very peculiar And he gets sucked into this very strange series of events in this big country house, which is full of very unusual residents who all seem to have strange quirks and different things going on. And it is a very dreamlike, beautifully written novel that captures the reader's attention in a strange, unusual way, because you're constantly wondering what is going on. But... Sarah Perry writes it in such a way that you are completely hooked. So I'd very much recommend After Me Comes the Flood, another hot summer read. And I would also like to thank Zoe Somerville on Twitter for her many suggestions, including Lucy McKnight Hardy's Water Shall Refuse Them, which was published in 2019. I haven't read this book, but it sounds great. I'm going to read you a little bit about it. It's a gothic novel set during a heat wave. Again, the heat wave of 1976, going back to that. Following the accidental drowning of her sister, 16-year-old Myth and her family moved to a small village in the Welsh borders to escape their grief. But rural seclusion doesn't bring any relief. As her family unravels, Myth begins to put together her own form of witchcraft, collecting talismans from the sun-starved land. That is, until she meets Mally, a teen boy who takes a keen interest in her and has his own secret rights to divulge. So that's Water Shall Refuse Them, an atmospheric coming-of-age novel, which is by Lucy McKnight Hardy. Rather a great-sounding one. Now, there's a book here that I must mention to you, if only because of its title, Heatwave, which is by Victor Jestin. And thanks Nick Kerwin for introducing me to this book, which is a lovely short novella, um, a mere, I think, about 85 pages long. And this is a great one 
uh, very intriguing and quite a worrying book in many ways. In terms of bibliotherapy, I would say it's definitely on the unsettling side of things and one that if you do read, I would definitely immediately afterwards read um, The Green Gage Summer by Rumor Godden to make you feel more optimistic about life and human nature. But I'll just read you the blurb because it does actually really make you want to read it and I can confirm it's a great read. Leonard is an outsider, a 17-year-old uncomfortable in his own skin. He's forced to endure a family holiday in the south of France. Tired of awkwardly creeping out of beach parties after a couple of beers, he chooses to spend the final Friday night of the trip in bed. However, when he cannot sleep due to the sound of wild carousing outside his tent, he gets up and goes for a walk. As he wanders among the dunes, he sees Oscar, one of the cooler kids, drunk in a playground, hanging by his neck from the rope of a swing. Frozen into inaction, Leonard watches Oscar's struggle to breathe until his body comes loose and falls lifeless to the ground. Unable to think straight, he buries Oscar in the sand and returns to the campsite, where, oppressed by the ferocious heat and the weight of what he did and did not do, he battles to keep a hold of his sanity, while all around him, holiday life, the fighting, the flirting, the swimming, the drinking continues as normal, oblivious to the tragedy that has unfolded. It's interesting that that blurb gives so much away. That does happen at the very beginning of the book. And when I read it, I did wonder, apologies to people who hate spoilers, I did wonder what it would be like to read that book without knowing that that happened. But it does happen in the very first few pages. So I do apologise. I actually think it probably is better to read it without having known that. Sorry, everyone. But the story is really all about, in a somewhat Albert Camus-like way, how you feel a lack of emotion when witnessing someone else's extremity of death. And... The, the hero of this book does have a rather similar attitude to L'Etranger in Albert Camus' book. Um, now, I was thinking I might read you a little bit just to give you a hint of what it's like, because it is beautifully written. And the reason why it's a great read is not just the drama that we just mentioned, but also the really great observation of what it's like being a teenager in a campsite uh, trying to have a good time on a, in a hot summer holiday. Um, I'll just read you this little section. Hold your horses. Just trying to find the right bit. He's talking about his brother Oscar. Now there was only Oscar. Oh no, he's not. it's not his brother. It's the guy that died. Now there was only Oscar. He stuck to me like stagnant water. He clung to my skin. At times I no longer knew how long he'd been dead, how long I'd been dragging him around with me along the paths. Besides, before the moment of his death, hadn't I had a premonition from childhood that everything was leading me towards all this? Nothing was new. All lines converged on this campsite where Oscar had been buried forever. All the distractions and tricks to forget it had now stopped working. The trips the campers made were short. To go get water, to lie down on a deck chair, to go grab a beer from the icebox. I needed something longer. I paced around. I killed Oscar, I whispered sometimes, so quietly that the confession was only for me. And I thought, me, yes, I'm here, I'm staying, I'm not giving up on myself. I wanted to take a shower. I hadn't washed since morning before. I was dirty. Too many different sweats were mixed up on my skin. Near the toilets, I saw my brother, Adrian, kissing a girl under a fake plant. He pulled away from her, looking embarrassed. Hi, Leo. What are you doing here? Walking, I said, pointing at the path. I looked at the girl who was waiting behind him. She looked embarrassed, too. She was about his age. Fifteen. Pretty. Adrian lowered his voice. Please don't tell Mum and Dad. I looked at him, my brother, with his checkered 
espadrilles, his perfect turn, and his little blue bracelet that he hadn't cut off that didn't fill him with shame. He was fine here. He blended into the landscape. He was on vacation, so distant from me. My brother the stranger, too happy to wonder anything. And now he was begging me with his puppy dog eyes, as if he knew nothing about all the poor and dying people in the world. Why would it matter if I, t if I told him? Sorry. Why would it matter if I told them? He was too scared. I don't know. I'd just rather you didn't say anything. You don't think you're allowed? Stop! So that's Heat Wave by Victor Jestin, which is a short, rather intriguing book about morality, really. But it all takes place in an intense heat wave in the south of France. It's about a boy who witnesses another boy's death and how that affects him for a very brief period. We're only with him for a few days on this campsite in the extreme heat. And it is a pretty compelling and un, uh, unhappy read, really. So read something much more positive after that. Uh, for instance, apart from some of the other books that I've mentioned already, Tom's Midnight Garden by Philippa Pierce, which is a fabulous children's book, but everyone should read it, frankly, not just the kids, because it's a really gorgeous, brilliant and lovely read, and it all takes place over one very hot summer. So this is a bit of a cheat in a way of a book to go into this theme, because it's not just one hot summer. Um, it's a time travel book. So it's the story of 12-year-old Tom, who, while staying with his aunt and uncle, discovers a magical, mysterious garden where he befriends a young girl named Hattie. Uh, the novel's been continually in print since 1958, when it was first published, now considered a classic children's book. And it's all about Tom, Tom's younger brother, Peter, getting the measles, and the boy's much anticipated plans to spend the summer holiday tree climbing are then derailed because the younger brother's got the measles. Poor Tom is sent away from their house where they have a small garden which they were intending to turn into a lovely place to play all summer. To a townhouse with his aunt and uncle where they don't have a garden at all. And he's incredibly depressed. He's been he's got to go there to get away to be in quarantine so he doesn't get the measles as well. And it's a really hot summer. He wants to hang out with his brother. But rather wonderfully, on the very first night when Tom goes to bed, he can't sleep because it's so hot. He goes downstairs to raid the larder and he hears the clock striking 13 times. And on the 13th stroke, he opens the door to go out into the street. And he doesn't go into the street. He goes into a garden because there's a magical garden there, which was in fact there a hundred years ago. And it's been bricked over and turned into a street. But Tom is able to time travel on the stroke of, stroke of the clock. And he goes back in time. And there he meets Hattie, the girl that lived in that garden. And he doesn't have control over what time of day he arrives in the garden. He might arrive in the middle of the night, or he might arrive at dawn, or he might arrive in the middle of Hattie playing a croquet game with her family on this lawn. And the joyous thing about the book is that Tom keeps going back and turning up in the garden at different times of Hattie's life and so he meets her first when she's about his age but then he keeps going back and slowly meeting her at different points in her life when she's got older and it's an incredibly touching, moving, beautiful, gorgeous read which does all take place over one summer but in a way it's a cheat because we also see Hattie's life as she grows up with his visits and in that way it's a bit like the time traveller's wife but I totally recommend it. It's a gorgeous magical read and 
it is all set in one hot and sultry summer. So, so there were other books that I wanted to mention. I'm going to have to save them for another occasion. But thank you so much for joining me this evening. It's been lovely having you here with me. And thanks for all your brilliant suggestions that you've been sending me during the day, um, nudging me about various hot summer reads. Next week on my own Facebook and Instagram pages, I'm going to be talking about festivals in literature because it's festival season and there's some fabulous festivals coming up. I've just been to a festival in Dublin, the Body and Soul Festival, thanks to Margaret London, which was an amazing and great festival. I had a brilliant time and did lots of bibliotherapy live for people there. And I'm going to be going to the Penzance Literary Festival on the 6th and 7th of July. Then it's the Idler Festival. And then there's also the North Cornwall Book Festival coming up later in the year. So I'm very much thinking about festivals and I think festivals in literature is a fun topic. So if any of you have any ideas about festivals in literature, do please tell me them. The next topic on the Damien Barr Literary Salon Facebook and Instagram pages by me is going to be Lazy Literature. And that's going to be on the 26th of July. I'm doing it then because I'm going to America for two weeks just before then. Oh, it's going to be on the 27th, 27th of July. And then a month after that in August, I'm going to be doing Great American Road Trips in Literature because of that fact that I'll be going to America with the whole family to my nephew's wedding, which is deeply joyous. So um, do watch out for those and also keep checking on Damien Barr's Facebook page and on the Damien Barr Literary Salon uh, website for all the upcoming salons and the various podcasts that are coming out now. Um, Damien is doing lots of fabulous podcasts with new authors every week. So keep checking those out too. And if you've got any other hot summer literature that you haven't shared with me yet, do please send it to me on Facebook, Instagram, or by email or on Twitter. Um, have a great rest of the week and I'll see you soon. Thanks for joining me. Bye.